The talk that you guys have found yourselves in is better hacking with training wheels. Um, I'm going to keep it short because uh, I'm efficient, um, but you're going to get your money's worth. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a Ruby library um, that you all already need. I guarantee you need it. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know why no one's put it out there before, but I'll do it just to get it started. Um, just to give you a little bit of history. Uh, Train Wheels has a you know quite a rich history. Um, it's been online for two days now, about 40 hours more or less. Um, and uh, I came up with this idea um, when I was just I was tripping out of my mind on <laughs> on RJ DJ. Anybody try that? Some, somebody knows what I'm talking about. If you guys have iPhones, get RJ, RJ DJ. It'll uh, it'll expand your horizons. Um, but uh, so, anyways, I came up with this idea based on a, a simple concept, um, and that concept was we all have a stake in each other. Um, you know, I, I don't think I have to sell this concept to anyone here. Um, you know, if you guys are you know part of conferences and stuff like that, I think you understand that. Um, but what I didn't want to do is misrepresent my talk. I know this sounds kind of like collectivism, um, so I wanted to offer some evidence to the contrary. Um, that this is not about collectivism. That's how you can get hold of me. Um, that's it's not a joke. I'm really capitalist on uh, on all that stuff. Um, anyways, back to my point. We all have a stake in each other, um, and what I mean by that is it's nearly impossible um, to exist in a vacuum in you know in the Ruby community. Almost everything you do, you know, just by the nature of the way we break up our work and the nature of the way. Um, you know, everyone contributes. You're using other people's libraries for everything you do, or you're using their platforms to run your stuff on. Um, you know, it's kind of just the way separation of labor has occurred in the Ruby community. So, um, you know, because it's evolved that way, we all have a vested interest in each other to, you know, to help each other grow. And, you know, and some would call it, you know, altruism. You know, Ruby people are nice people. Um, you know, others like like myself. You know, it may be that you know I want to see you guys do well because then the Ruby community as a whole does well, and you know I make more money or have more friends or something like that. Um, so, one of the things that we do as a community is we talk about what we do a lot. Um, so, like personally, in my feed reader, I've got like probably a hundred of your blogs. And you know it's really difficult to, to keep up with everything. You know if I go on vacation for three days, you know I've got 2,000 entries to read when I get back. Um, I watch everyone's peepcast, so or screencast. If you made one, I've seen it. Um, so you know I try to keep up with with all the best practices that you guys are sharing with the libraries you're putting out there. So if I encounter that problem, then you know then I'll know about the library and know it exists. Um, but what I wanted was a more efficient way to, to have that pop up when I need it. So you know, let's say today I saw um, a talk on you know, little tricks to increase performance you know, of your application. You know, I mean, little stuff like don't do a nil check because you can use whether something has a value or not as a Boolean. So you don't need the extra method call and just stuff like that. So um, I want to be reminded of those things. Like I'm, I have terrible memory. I want to be reminded of those things when I need them. So that's what Training Wheels is all about is, um, you know, let's make a, a portable way to, uh, to introduce or, or to, to pass around all these, these Ruby idioms. So um, yeah, that's, that's my unicycle. Um, I'm still, still learning. But so when we talk about a best practice or, you know, or an idiom or, you know, the best way to use a library, um, you know, we still do it in text. You know, we pass it around in blog posts, or we do it in videos and stuff like that. Uh, but we're Rubyists, so you know, I would like to see us do that in an automated fashion, um, in a way that you know we can share it with everyone, and they they get it when they need it. So this is an example of of kind of how we work now. Um, you know, if you're working on a library or or something like that, um, you know, you're writing your Ruby code, you're running it. To, to see if it does what you want. And the Ruby interpreter is going to ensure that you have valid syntax. Because you know, what happens if you leave an end out? You know, you're going to get 
a crazy error that unexpected end because it wanted a K end or something like that. So it's, you know, that, that's type or that's, you know, syntax checking built in. So the next step is, is testing. Um, one of the things that has just been absolutely harped on, um, and that has a negative connotation, but, you know, just really reinforced by, by everyone is testing. Um, you know, whether it's test unit or RSpec or shoulda, um, we want to verify that our results are what we expect them to be all the time. So, so testing kind of verifies our results, but the problem is there's nothing in the middle. We have, you know, basically all this flexibility available to us, um, you know, as far as Ruby goes, but we have nothing to, you know, to ensure that we make good use of it. And we don't have literally nothing. There's, like, this is becoming kind of fashionable um, as of late to do code analysis, like treating the code as data. Um, and there are some really awesome tools out there that, you know, they're fairly young, um, like Flog and, and Heckle and Flay, and they all do, like, you know, a certain kind of analysis, whether it's, you know, checking for duplications or, you know, mutating your code to see if your tests still pass or something like that. Um, so they do a good job of treating your code as data to analyze it and make sure that you're doing, you know, this stuff. But what I wanted was an easy way to, to dash off, you know, uh, a certain example. This is a pattern I just saw, and I want to use it, you know, when I need it. Um, so I put together this slide where I started thinking about, here's all the scenarios where you could use something like that. And so let's say you had a way to easily encapsulate one idea, one best practice pattern. Well, if you're learning a new library, how many people, um, raise your hand if you, like you pick a library that you're gonna try to use and you just fire it up. You don't go through all the docs. You know, you just try to, to actually instantiate whatever it is and you know, so I see about half your hands. Um, if you're learning a new library, imagine if it had like a directory that shipped along with it called wheels. And in wheels was just this, this small set of classes that the library developer put in there for you. And this goes for the published library as well. They put in there for you and as soon as you instantiate a class that you weren't supposed to, or you know, you start using this, um, you know, it can tell through analysis looking at your code like what you're trying to do and suggest via either standard out or you know a growl notification or whatever, suggest some way for you to you know to actually use it the way they intended. Um, and so as a publisher, what you know you could cut down on like a lot of uh, like questions I don't know if everyone here has published something open source, but you get a lot of questions. And they're the same questions over and over. And open source developers, like the ones I've encountered are incredibly gracious about answering you know, the same questions over and over. But the slide that we saw in Matt's keynote this morning that said we're gonna have four million <coughs> Ruby developers, you know, that kind of scared me because I'm not sure how far that's gonna scale. And I'm not sure if, you know, if everyone's gonna shut down because they have four million Ruby developers asking them, you know, how do they use their library and stuff like that. Um, so those are a couple ideas. Um, if you've ever trained a colleague, um, I've had to do this a couple times, and one of the things you can do is you could just automatically have whatever your, you know, your corporate you know, data style requirements are, you can encode those in Ruby and, you know, and actually drop them into the developer's wheels directory and that, you know, that style would be enforced as they're working. Um, so, and lastly, I've learned Ruby down there. Uh, just because, you know, with, with anything, you could have these training wheels running just against plain Ruby for, you know, common Ruby idioms and stuff like that. So, let me get into, uh, jump into what a wheel actually looks like. And this is just my start on, on a DSL for a way to encode idioms, right? So, um, here, here's one where I'm working on the or assign operator. So if you're new to Ruby, you've probably never seen that operator. You don't know how it's used. Um, these, these methods, trigger and suggest, those are just you know, what I came up with um, you know, when I was dashing out this prototype for this talk. Um, you know, trigger would be what it's looking for. Um, you know, so if you do a, you know, an actual nil check just to assign a variable, it could spot that. Um, and just to give you an idea of how I started doing this under the hood, um, there's a tool called parse tree and you know, I'm, I'm sure, a, who's familiar with parse tree? All right, looks like about most of you. So parse tree breaks your code down into a standard structure um, called S expressions. 
And so what's cool about code like this is even if I did that if condition as a post condition, the yes expression comes out virtually the same. So a masher can you know, still match it up regardless of how they actually chose to write it. Um, so what you do, like what trigger does is just breaks that code down to an S expression. And then as it's analyzing any of the code they write as they save files, like I stole, uh, I stole the file checking stuff out of R stakeout, if anyone's ever used that. So it just sits there and runs. Every time you save a file, analyzes it, and tries to match it up against these patterns. And then right now, suggest all it does, you see it's just a string because it just spits it out standard out. But when I was playing around with this, I had it spit it out to, uh, I piped it to say on the Mac. So it was, you know, it was reading it out to me, so I didn't even have to go look at it. Um, and then you know, I, I shot it out to Growl. Um, but these are just you know, two methods that, with just those two methods in a DSL, you, know, you could do a whole lot. Well, one of the things I wanted to do, one of the other examples was I was gonna do a framework example. Um, and so I wanted to do alias method chain. There we go. Um, so I need to introduce a little more flexibility. So I made it where with, with trigger you could pass a block to. And if you pass a block, it basically works where the first pattern, that's like, says pay attention to whatever this block says pay attention to or do whatever this block says. So it, it spots this first pattern and it immediately rewrites what it's looking for in this case to, you know, to spot this second pattern. So if it sees you alias method twice in a row, then you know, it can suggest alias method chain. And you know, this, this exact example is a little brittle because maybe you really alias method twice in a row for a good reason. Um, and I'm not doing any analysis on the literals and the prototype, but you could. Um, so maybe you could make it as strict as if they did some method without something, then you know they're just adding a feature, they're decorating a method that already exists. Um, so that's just an example of you know, how flexible this DSL could get while still being really readable. Like if you have a thought, I want you to be able to just really you know, jot it down in a wheel to remind yourself when you need it and, and drop it in like a wheels directory in your home directory or something like that. Um, so if, you know, if we can get you know, just a handful of people in the habit of doing something like that, um, then we can end up with this, you know, this giant automated library that enforces good patterns. Um, so it's also really easy to add other methods. You know, so based on like what Jameis was saying, I don't have to put all the stuff you could do um, in here. You guys could open this up, you know, just download training wheels and open it up and add your own methods to the, to the DSL. And so here's an example of that one. Um, so let's say on my alias method chain, I want to do some more explanation. Like I know Air the Blog had a good, um, a good article explaining it. So let's say I wanted to, you know, to drop out to a gist that everyone can work on and fine tune the explanation so that, you know, that people get it. Well, you know, I could have a method, you know, this method that I wrote and just included in there to illustrate that is, you know, just gist with the gist ID. And so as soon as this pattern's triggered, It'll just you know open up that gist and you know and that's it. So, like I said, this talk is uh, is pretty short, um, but uh, that's the repo that that Training Wheels is in. And uh, so, anyone have any questions? Can you go back to your boring slide? I sure can. Yeah. So you said that you're not paying attention to literals. Um, I assume that includes the, the variable names, but what if you want a wild card method? So if you want a wild card method? If, if you don't want something like as specific as nil a, you want something nil or blank or something like that. Something, something. Yeah, so either, either a disjunction of, of multiple patterns you want or just a wild card in a particular spot, how can you do that? That's a great question. Right now you can't do it. Because right now all it's doing, you know, it's just to illustrate this, that we need this way to, you know, to encode these idioms. This is all I dropped in. Um, but you know, that's a great idea for a feature. And so you know, maybe we could have it where the trigger takes, like, I want something that's pretty, like a hash of, you know, here's pay attention to literals, or you know, don't pay attention to this method name, because maybe they'll use blank, or something like that. Um, or you know, maybe we can do it with, with interpolation right there in some way that looks pretty, you know? Where we interpolate something you know, something in there that indicates this part can be anything. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Or, or only match the S, S expression so far. Don't go deeper than <laughs> to the point 
you'd have to be able to mark that and trigger something. I'm not sure how you do that. Yeah, so, like, so for the S expressions, once I get to the part with the literals, like the args for a method or something, I just ignore it. Because I haven't put in anything. For example, you've got my bar equals empty array. Mm -hmm. well, what if I want my bar equals empty hash or my bar equals anything? What you want, what you might want to consider is a way in the trigger to say my bar equals anything, and that anything means ignore the S, S expression from here on down. Yeah, at this point. That's actually how it is now, because what happens is it sees a variable, in this case an instance variable, so it sees IVAR, assignment, and some literal. So that's actually how it is now, is because once it gets to some literal, it doesn't care what you're assigning. It just says, you know, you're assigning a literal, so, and a actually, really we could make it even more general than that, because what if you're assigning another variable? That will trip up the matcher right now, because it's looking for literals only. So we have it where just because it sees this assignment after a, after a nil check, then it knows that it needs to, you know, su suggest this certain pattern. So, yes? Can you have more than one trigger? Can you have multiple triggers? Okay, yeah, so that's, that's a thing that I thought of, and that's, that's not built in. So we have this, like, conditional trigger. Right, so we have this now, but, like, what you're saying is, like, there could be five ways to suggest, you know, that you need to suggest something. And so, yeah, there's no reason that, like right now, all it does, as soon as you call trigger, it just stores an instance variable with that S expression in it. And it's just called trigger pattern. There's no reason we couldn't make trigger pattern an array. And then, you know, when it's passing in the nodes to that wheel to check if it matches, then it can just iterate over that array and, and see if any of those match. Um, does anyone have, also, besides questions, I'd like to hear ideas of where this would apply. Um, because, you know, I'm just starting on this and you know, so anything of, of where it could apply would be useful. Yeah. Could you have it auto read back to your code for you? It might work better for the for example. So you know what the code looks like now, and you know what you want it to look like based on the suggestion. So auto refactor it, say right now it says dot nail. Actually replace that with or equals. Yeah, well yeah, you could do that. Like so let's say you captured the literals that they used. You could um, output you know the exact code to, to copy and paste into there. So now you give a contextual suggestion as opposed to just you know here's you know some text that says what I want you to do. Here's an example with your code. Yeah, yeah. You, you just reminded me of another another idea I had in that um, performance talk. Um, what if you had like a, a block that was like um, you know this method ran in you know two seconds, but you could profile it like right there on the spot and say. You know, if you change it to this, it does the exact same thing, but it runs in, you know, 1.5 seconds or something like that. Like, there's no reason this DSL couldn't have stuff like that in it as well. So, any other questions or ideas? Uh, this looks like it would be really great for kind of uh, tactical level refactors, like language usage stuff, but larger uh, kinds of refactoring, you would really need more you need to be able to stay, uh, store more state or something, so you could say this entire uh, application has uh, too many classes or they're too coupled or something like that. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about that. Like parse tree, it doesn't, like right now this thing's reading code from files, but parse tree can read stuff right out of the object space. So you could have it, you know, rooting around in the object space and looking for, um, you know, for certain patterns that you used, you know, across files that you couldn't spot just within one file. So yeah, that's something else I thought of. Or like s somewhere else this would be useful. Um, where I originally tried to do something like this was upgrading to Rails 2 a long time ago when it came out. Um, you know, if you're, one of the problems with web frameworks is when you change something, everyone freaks out. And so, you know, it takes a long time for those changes to actually propagate across, you know, all your users where you know, they're used to it, they're comfortable with the new way of doing things. But if, you know, if training wheels shipped along with your app, if there was a set of wheels that just went through, let's say it's pagination, and went through and saw everywhere you were doing pagination, which would be really easy, and says, you know, we use plugins for this now, your choices are classic or will paginate, you know, or something like that, then it'd be really easy. There's something there holding your hand as you're trying to upgrade your app to the newest edition of, you know, of that framework. Yes, sir? Is there a way to not ignore the literals? For example, the paginate example, you might want to be looking for a particular method name. 
Yeah, there, there actually has to be. I mean, there's a lot of cases where um, you're going to want to do stuff with literals. Like, let's say, you know, I was using um, some some configuration, some library that requires a configuration, and I pass in some number that just doesn't make sense, like to a method that has an acceptable range. What we might do now is um, like raise an error that's just a string to alert the developer. That's really annoying. You get stopped, and you know, and the program errors out and stuff like that. Well, you could have a training wheel that just like actually looks at the literal arguments and says that's not a good idea. Here's why. I thought you implied earlier that the triggers always ignore literals. I was wrong. No, no, you're absolutely right. I'm saying like this is my proof of concept. I'm saying you're right that they absolutely need to have a way to to work with the literals. Yes, sir. Maybe, maybe one of the ways that suggests could output stuff is is by actually raising it as an error for, for continuous integration. I didn't even think about. Like kind of like there might be a suggestion, and there might be like an error level, right? Like sometimes you might want to just say, "Oh, you might have a problem," but other times, no, this is not acceptable in our codebase. Yeah, we could make that a method where instead of suggest, you just call error, and then it knows. Like we could have suggest or growl or say or error or you know, yeah, and just. Yep, and build out this, this like, I'm, I'm not the best library designer. Um, I put this out here for that reason, to put it out here and to get people interested in it because I want to see the community, um, you know, develop this automated way to pass patterns around because I want your patterns. So, yes, sir. I'm a little confused as to your nested trigger example. Is there a technical reason why you can't have the two alias methods in the same pattern? Or... Does that nested trigger imply that any following alias method is going to trigger this thing? This is, it, it, it actually does. Yes to both cases. Like, I was being lazy with the example when I picked. I, I did the nested trigger just to show that, hey, we can pass blocks to these things that allow us a lot more flexibility. That's why the tile size more flexibility is a really bad example to just use another pattern that needs to see because it absolutely could have and would have actually made more sense to just be in the same trigger in the first place. So. Just remember to repeat the question, okay? Okay. Some Sorry. people in the room may not have heard it. Okay. Yes, sir. There's, there's another tool I came across recently called REEK, R-E-E-K. Okay. It's more of just a, a static analysis tool, but I wonder if you've seen that. No, I haven't seen that one. So, it, I mean, I'm judging by the name. Oh, the question was, uh, you know, have I seen REEK? Um, I'm judging by the name that it does, like, maybe code smells, you know, yeah, just... Yeah, it's looking for smells. Okay, yeah, yeah, it just there in general. Um, the, the problem with smells um, and, and detectors like that is, you know, you guys know that a lot of people are very opinionated. So I wanted something that was more general where the, the whatever you're looking for is outside of the library. So if you don't like it, you can just delete it, you know, just take it out. Um, you know, and maybe we'll have a way for, you know, to have, like, a wheel... RC file where you can permanently ignore certain wheels that you don't ever want to see. So, yes, sir. Um, how about triggers based on the absence? Of I'm sorry. What about? How about triggers based on the absence of code? Like, for example, if you uh, save several things in the database and you want to make a trigger to suggest you wrap that in a transaction because you don't see a transaction. Okay. Um, the question was, what about triggers in the absence of code? Um, so yeah, we could have like, let's say a trigger that that spots, you know, in, in the case that he gave is multiple saves. Maybe they need to be in a transaction. So, you know, maybe the trigger is actually those saves, and then it it looks like, you know, the framework stores for the wheel the previous nodes that it saw. It could go back and check if it saw a transaction and say, you know, maybe you should use the transaction. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I like the idea. I'm a little confused about the actual implementation. Would this be, is this running dynamically, or would I, would I call on this very much like I would call a rate test to run tests? Um, actually, either way. So in the, in the proof of concept that I put on GitHub, there's a bin directory, and there's um, a binary called training wheels, and there's one called training wheels auto. And the only difference is the training wheels one, you, you pass it a glob, and it just runs any wheels that it can find. 
And right now it looks in the examples directory, but I'll probably make it look in like a home wheels directory. I mean, the training wheels auto one, you run it like auto test or something like that. You know, it runs just like our stakeout because that's where I copy the code out of. Um, and so with that one, you just run it. And every time you save a file, it will reload that code, send it back into Parse3, and, and Parse3 will pass all the nodes to all the wheels that are, that are loaded. So. It'd be really worthwhile to wrap up the regular one into a rig task. Like just a, you know, where you can run rig training wheels. And, yeah, that way you can hook it up to yeah, the actually, cruise control the task. Yeah, actually, the task, I think that would be very useful. Okay, so yeah, wrap it up in a, in a rig task, and maybe, maybe I'll make it as a plug-in for common frameworks, too, where you just load it, and so if you have the server running, training wheels is running, you know, as long as it's in development mode or something like that. So, yes, sir. So the other thing that occurs to me about your examples are that you could very easily make them look a lot like R spec or maybe Cucumber, you know, the story runner. You probably don't need to declare classes per se. I bet you could do those kinds of DSLs and still achieve the same thing. The classes might be handy to call on. Okay. okay. So, so his comment is that you know maybe we can make this even cleaner by um, by doing something like story runner. Um, and that's that's a brilliant idea. Like we could use like uh, Treetop or something like that, and actually do like some kind of parsing where we can get you know even cleaner with with how we run this. Um, like one of the things that irritated me when I was making this proof of concept is I needed to instantiate the wheels because I needed to be able to run multiple copies of them. Like let's say you you spot one alias method. Well, now I need another wheel looking for it again. Um, if you want to run a separate instance of that, because now this one, after it spots it the first time, it's looking for the second instance. So I needed to instantiate them, so I had to put those methods in an initialize block because I couldn't figure out how to go from a static class method, which is how I started with these, and somehow write that down into an instance variable. So I ended up just wrapping the whole thing in an initialize block, you know, just to, to get it done. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you throw that uh, info URL back up? Absolutely. All right, so yeah, that's, that's where it is online. Would you include, maybe it's over design, would you include any documentation, like maybe an expanded readme, part of the output of a, of a, a wheel, wheel, whatever you want to call it? Expanded documentation. Is that neat? In what sense? Well, I liked your suggestion that I just got a library I've never seen before, and because I'm not at all pragmatic, I'm just going to run it and see what it does. So it would use the auto wheels probably, rather than read, in, in addition to reading the code and finding out where I may have just misapplied your intentions, if it were to give me a little block of introductory, you know, read me type info, I don't know, maybe that's just over design. It was an idea that just struck me. Yeah, I so to my library. Here's the reason I wrote it. Here's what you can expect out of it. And by the way, you were dummy because you didn't read this first before you read it. Right. So the comment was, um, you know, maybe there's a way that we can output more documentation other than like the examples I had had just a sentence. Um, and that's that's actually the main reason I put in that gist method um, was I was thinking, you know, along the same lines that, you know, if you farm it out to gist, then people can fork that documentation if they don't like it. So like if they're going to give that wheel to someone else, they can fork it, change the ID, and say, here's my better explanation of, of this, you know, this certain pattern or something like that. Um, and that's the same reason it's on GitHub. I mean, it's an amazing tool. And so I put it on there, and, you know, and really the tool set is really in place, I, I think, for the first time for us to do something like this with, um, with Parse Tree and Unified Ruby and, and Ruby to Ruby and all that stuff. We have such an, like, a robust tool set to actually do something like this for the first time. And to my knowledge, we'd be you know, the first you know, large community doing it. Um, so with GitHub, like, you know, I'm gonna be a steward of that thing. I'm gonna be looking for everyone forking it and you know, any good ideas that they have in there that we can, you know, we can move over. Um, what I'm hoping is you know, developers better than myself really you know, actually think it's a good idea and really jump in and, you know, and fork it and something like that. Um, another thought I had based on the documentation vein is what if we could do something with, with the way our doc works now? Where like you get your wheels for free somehow just by doing something you know along with your your stuff that you put in for our doc, but you know I don't know our doc well enough to actually come up with with anything concrete on that. Any more questions? All right, that looks like it. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, you know spending your time learning about training wheels and uh, 
if you have you know any ideas at all, um, you know either fork the repo or at the very least Twitter them over to me or something like that, uh, because you know I, I want to see this thing build out and us actually build a catalog of wheels for Ruby and you know and all the big libraries and stuff like that. Thank you.